Is that mobile type spot not strong enough or? Well, I, I think that's being spread in. We'll make it a podcast. That's fine. <laughs> Why does the screen keep dimming? Okay. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the June 2023 meeting of the St. Mary's County Library Board of Trustees. Uh, my name is Michael Dunn. I'm the president. We do have a quorum of trustees present so we can move forward. Uh, why don't we go around the horn and do some introductions, starting with Dorothy. Dorothy Waters, trustee. Judith Gwynn, trustee. John Johnston, vice president. Uh, Tressa Setlack, treasurer. John Walters, trustee. Thanks, everybody. Um, the first item of business is the approval of the June 2023 minutes, which are in our packets. Folks want to take a look and we can entertain a motion to approve if anyone would like to do so. I have a question on the, I guess it's page two, Roman numeral six, um, item E, sub item one, where it says yes. The additional member is not a community member. Actually, that's not true, and we have an update on that. Okay, so was this incorrect then? We need to. Uh, no, that's what was stated last time. Um, uh, and that's the information we had at the time. But in fact, um, and, and so that is correct as a re record of the meeting minutes. Um, and what we're going to find is that two members are desired. And one should be a library board member, and the other can be a community member. And we've got that on the agenda to discuss later. I verified that with Smurla yesterday, just to make sure. Any other questions or comments about the minutes? I okay. move to adopt the uh, made minutes as written. Thank you, John. Second. Thank you, Dorothy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Moving on to the EALs, the monthly expense ledger. Any comments or questions about these records? I have a question on page one, about a third of the way down. Uh, Barefoot Graphics, 8,800 and change for the library wrap. Um, if that's the bill for the wrap, has that been completed? No, that was the down payment for the wrap. We can't complete it. We don't have the library yet. Well, if that's a down payment, what's the total? Maybe? We will know after they finish. So that's most of it. We just don't know what if there will be any additional yet. That's what they believe it will be. Okay. Then my next question based off of that is, what is the artist commission going to be? We are already paid the artist, and it was on the last EAL. It was at the last month? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, on the same page, if I may, two items down. Uh, date is 5-18-23 to SB and company for last year's audit. Yes, um, he got the bill late. A year. <laughs> okay. We mentioned last month that we had that bill already. And it, was, it didn't show up in last month's EALs because it was still set for payment. But when did they actually invoice us? 
they invoiced us in November, but we didn't get it. Okay. It got lost in the e email. They sent an email invoice and we did not receive it. I don't know if it got sent to spam or what, um, but they sent a reminder saying, well, where, where's this? And we said, well, um, send it to us. So that is why it is about six months late. Okay. okay. On the next page, uh, date is uh, June 2. To Communico, it says reservation system. Can you explain that term, please? Yes, we have a reservation system that we use for the library system. So when we, anyone, any patron and our staff who want to reserve meeting rooms, study rooms, um, equipment, we reserve this room for this meeting every month. We reserve our equipment for it. It is the reservation system that we use for that. All right. So it's used by both our staff and all of our patrons, and it goes to, uh, it links all of the three libraries and their meeting rooms and equipment available for winter or reservation. And, and for the public, that's available from the website. If you say, you know, I want a meeting room, you log in, that's the system that works behind that from the website. Is that a, a, the annual cost? Yes. Past or future? Do they charge us ahead or? It's, I'm just curious. You mean like what are they billing us for right now? Yeah, like they that thousand was it for last year's or the last twelve months, or are we paying ahead? No, we pay ahead. That's okay. actually just our portion. Smurla pays the majority of it. It is very expensive software. It does a lot of things. Sure. Sure, just for those are my only questions. Um, I had a question on six two, page three. Robotic cards. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's a it's it's something to use for our um, programming for STEM programming. It'll be used by the mobile library and our programming staff. These are the Lego cards. I believe so, but I am not privy to exactly what they look like. <laughs> Is it like specifically a summer program or is this something you can use year round? We're using it continuously. It is a, it's something that we can continue to use for several years. So if you had this and you're just replenishing your cars, like they we did not have it. This is brand new. Yes. Okay. Judith, I'm sorry. Where are you seeing that? Can you Page three, six, two, and June 2nd, zero, and it's robotic cars for programming. Middle of the. Yeah. 1,661. Any other questions or comments about the EALs? Okay. Are we can entertain a motion to put them? So moved. Thank you, John. Second. Thank you, Judith. All in favor of approving the EALs, please say aye. 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 The opposer abstained. No, motion carried. All right, uh, we are not due for our next treasure report until July. Tessa, unless you to jump in. I am not. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we can move on and continue the Smurla conversation. John, let's turn things over to you. Well, the update I have uh, last month is only that we had a closed session to discuss uh, personnel matters. And as uh, Michael was explaining, um, but if, if we understand correctly that uh, um, the counties will have uh, three representatives on the board, two trustees and a community member. Yeah, that is correct. I verified that yesterday just because there was some confusion. Um, the state bill that was moving forward on the regional libraries was amended at the last minute from a representative from Montgomery County who was concerned that it would allow shall we say, um, difficult elements to staff the regionals. And um, so basically there's no real change in the makeup of the Smurla board to speak of. Uh, they want three representatives from St. Mary's County and in fact, uh, Calvert and Charles too. And two of those would be um, members of the library boards and one would be from the public. So they, will try to find, and, and we can certainly help them, um, a member of the public, but they would like 
two members from this board if possible, and Beth Roth, who had been uh, standing in, even though she was not a trustee, and but had been, um, has stepped down from the Smyrla board. So um, it's really kind of is anybody other than than John interested in that? And John, maybe you can fill us in on how frequently the meetings are and what the kind of duties are. Well, usually during the first half of the year, or the, maybe the first third of the year, um, we'll uh, meet monthly. You know, in, in the need to be able to get the fiscal year wrapped up and and other issues. And, and that's the way it's worked out um, um, th this year. And, and, and then usually like the, the second uh, two thirds or the second half of the year, it's usually been every other month. And it happens we have uh, an, a, another meeting next month that'll be Zoom only. It'll and is it other. like a, a set day of the month, not by number, but by the third Wednesday or something? Ex ex second Tuesday. Second Tuesday. Yeah. And, and last last one's meeting was um, we we had a, the second one because you know the need to have that closed session, mm -hmm. but normally it's second Tuesday. So are any of our trustees interested in taking on this role? Just during the day or the evening? Um, typically five five o'clock. That, 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 that occasionally changes. And the meetings are up in Charlotte Hall. Yes. And sometimes they're on Zoom, but uh, um, it's it's been half and half so far in my experience. Is it, is it similar? You've got to this. We've got budget issues, policy decisions. Yes. So I'm hearing Sharon volunteer. <laughs> uh, well, we will talk to Sharon about that. <laughs> We, I think, sort of figure out who among us can step up. I've been in the air in conversation for these last few meetings. Think about as a whole, uh, and it seems to be a very positive experience from what John has shared. They have some really dynamic leadership at Smyrla, so I think it's an exciting time to work with that group. And do we also need a community member? Is that what I hear? Yes, so we're, we we're, we don't necessarily have to find that community member that can be on Smurl. I mean, we could help them, and I have the application which we can send out, for example, as part of our um, emails to our customers. But it would be their responsibility to find the community member. We did ask if Belinda could serve, and they said no. <laughs> um, that this would would be. Too much, they thought a conflict of interest, and and we argued the point, but but that's not going to work for us. So, well, based on what John has told us about the frequency of meetings, the date of the meetings, and the time of the meetings, I'm willing to be the default nominee. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Doesn't that. mean there shouldn't be somebody ahead of me, but yeah. if there isn't, I'll be the default. And how long is the term? Um, three years, I, um, I believe it's either two or three. I can look that up. Judith is dying to do it. She just oh, doesn't want to say thought. that. I'm okay. going to get thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, I, but I will think about it. Okay. okay. Thank you, Judith. Would, would it be appropriate for any of the uh, interested trustees to speak with uh, Ashley directly? Yeah, we, we certainly can, if that would help folks make a more informed choice. I would ask, it would be great if we could come back for our July meeting with a resolution on this question. Um, so, John, thank you. Judith, thank you for considering. Thank you, everybody, for considering. And let's let's lock this in for July, okay? Okay, thank you, John, on the Smurl update. Um, Michael, let's turn it over to you for celebrations. Well, thank you. And everybody, please join me in a rousing version of the Platters Immortal Hit Smoke Gets In Your Eyes. <laughs> um, do be careful out there, folks. We've got code orange here um, in the air quality. Uh, we're going to start with some staff celebrations. And the first one is to two members of our A-team, Amy Ford and Amy Dickinson, um, who are creating an outstanding assertive communication training, which they presented to all St. Mary Community Library staff at the Maryland Library Association Conference and State Library Resource Center Spring Conference. 
hands-on training and valuable to achieving excellent customer service. So this is simply talking to people about working with difficult customers and how very effectively to de-escalate and yet um, not be trampled upon um, by somebody who's being, shall we say, less than ideally polite. Um, so thank you so much, Amy and Amy for that. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, I attended the training at Women's Library Association and found it very helpful indeed. Um, and so this went out to an audience of library personnel from across the state? Yes, yeah. Um, That's fantastic. And actually Delaware as well, state of Delaware as well. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, kudos on that as well. Um, the next one is for uh, Jacob, or we call him Jake Parsons. For great work soliciting donations of food comp uh, coupons from area businesses for summer reading initiatives. So Jake volunteered to take this job on for all three branches. And, and we go out to you know, businesses in the community and say, wouldn't you like to give a coupon to the library? So, and we give them away as prizes of summer reading. And so, you know, not everybody's comfortable approaching community merchants, although they tend to be very good when they deal with the library. So uh, thank you, Jake, for taking that on. And he's got a larger number and a wider variety than they've ever had before. Can I make a comment about that? Mm -hmm. um, Jake really stepped out of his comfort zone to do that. And he did it for that reason. He really wanted to work on his telephone skills. And so he volunteered to do that. And, and so that's why it deserved a hip hip hooray. Yeah. Michael, before you go on, is this like a a coupon for a Big Mac contributed by yeah Mac yeah or? yeah basically it's you know um, a shake or a, a frosty or or something like you know it, it's just a small thing and and the merchants of course benefit too because typically when you're going to go you, you say well here's my free frosty and I guess I might as well get a you know a, a Dave single as well so uh, it it is a, a mutual benefit do for they you. expire uh, I don't. Uh, um, yeah, so, some do and some don't. It, but the expiration date is typically quite some time when they do expire. Thank you. So, um, our next one is for Jeffrey, whom we call Jeff Stainbrook. Um, he also created a program that was up at the Maryland Library Association that I attended. Uh, this one was about the importance of audiobooks and especially how they help meet a diverse customer population. And audiobooks are still one of the gaining areas in, in library circulation. We just can't seem to uh, keep enough of them as we know from subscribing to our Hoopla because that's the primary thing that people use on Hoopla are those uh, audio books. So, um, and that was a well-attended program. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, sort of spreading the word about that. Um, I work, Jeff. Thank you. I, I also presented a two-hour program at the Maryland Library Association. It was here's a huge surprise for everybody on ebooks, but I'm, I, I thought it was a little bit too self-congratulatory to give my, myself a hip hip hooray. So we're not going to do that. Well, good job, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> nice work. Nice work. Um, it was actually very informative. We did a uh, a learning session as part of it, and I gave them a list of 400 titles and a budget, and said, "Okay, now." Go ahead and build your collection. But oh, incidentally, um, here are four bestsellers that are coming out that you better make sure you're keeping. And here are six of your titles that are expiring that you better make sure you're re-upping because they're very popular too. And they discovered that by the time they covered what they needed to get, they had practically nothing left to get new titles. Yes, um, lesson learned about eBooks and why we still continue to try to work with publishers on that. Um, we'll move over to, um, actually, let me give you some library news first. Um, the um, first, um, I especially thanks for the Lexington Park staff and Amy is the Judy Center Early Learning Hubs Lunch and Learn Summer Meal Program. This is a partnership of the St. Mary's County Schools, the Department of Social Services, a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture, and of course, your St. Mary's County Library. So for 10 weeks during the summer, meals for children 18 and under will be free as part of this program, and their parents may join them. And 
there's a grant that was acquired by the Department of Social Services to pay for those parents' lunches. In many cases, these are children who will not necessarily have a good meal otherwise. And so on Fridays throughout the summer, um, it will be here. Uh, the Judy Center people help provide a take-home activity, but our library staff has a lunch and learn activity that they do with these families. So uh, that's been an ongoing program for quite a few number of years. It does bring a lot of people into the library. And, and I think more than anything else, it's just a great service for families in this area. So Amy, especially, thank you for making sure that works again. And the next one I actually have, um, later on, but I go ahead and cover it now, um, is the distribution of the connected devices, the fast track grant. Um, the state of Maryland is giving Chromebooks to the various counties and our county is getting 4,500 of them. And except for the devices that'll go to seniors, the library is the distribution center. So we are partnering very effectively with the county. Um, and they, the first one's going to be on the 17th, so coming up very quickly this Saturday, and the other two libraries will be involved as well. So here's their distribution plan. At Station 1, um, people will come in and verify that they're eligible to receive one, and, and there's several different ways that you are eligible uh, to get one of these. Um, but primarily, it's going to be to people who let's just say are not as affluent as some of their neighbors might be. Um, and then um, any person who cannot be validated as eligible, they're going to get their contact information on follow-up just to try to make sure they're getting the device to them. Uh, the University of Maryland is working and coming down. They're going to assist with the initial setup of the machine and provide tech support information. And then finally, the Affordable Connectivity Program the both local cable uh, providers are expressing interest in participating in the event and there's federal money to try to help get broadband homes that don't have it. So um, finally with connectivity, uh, assisting our citizens with getting broadband to their homes, we in the library know that we're gonna get a lot of follow-up questions because people are getting the devices here. So we're getting staff ready to answer questions about what's on the Chromebooks and how to use them. And this is, I think, a great initiative to try to make sure that everybody in the county has access to broadband. Uh, there are some areas where, you know, it simply doesn't exist in other areas where people may struggle to afford it. And it's getting to be that it's almost as essential as electricity. So thank you to the county for partnering with us on that. And Michael, this will take place at each of the three branches? Yes. Um, and there's a schedule for it basically throughout the summer. And how many total will we have available to distribute? There'll be 4,500 in the county. And we have so far, although the number may have increased since I got this email two days ago, about 300 people waiting for this Saturday's event. So you're going to basically start out by dividing the, the lump sum into equal parts? Well, actually, the, the county is going to be the ones, the county IT department will be the ones bringing it to the library. So they're coming here the Friday before, and I think they're bringing, they say, two, um, how many did they say they were bringing, Amy, do you remember? Yeah, uh, at, at least 300 to cover demand. I think they're probably going to bring probably five or 600 here for that initial day. And then, you know, because the, the libraries are fairly conveniently located throughout the county, although we could certainly use a location far south, um, people will uh, will be able to come to the libraries to get those devices. Okay, will this happen on successive days to go through the inventory or once a week? It, it'll be about once every two weeks on Saturdays. And there, there is a schedule of that posted with the county. All right, thank you. And good morning, Sharon. Thank you for joining us. So um, to follow up, so, it sounds like this is really a county program and they're using the library facility exactly, to yeah. reach the communities. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. So your staff isn't responsible for securing them or. No, we're not, or... but we know we're going to get follow up questions on the use oh, of them. Okay. So, we'll come um, back in and yeah. Say, oh, I can't figure out how to. Turn exactly. My yeah. I, I, how do I, how do I get this thing to work will probably be the most common question. Um, because in many cases, they may be going to people who have got a lot of experience. The good news is that a Chromebook is fairly easy to use. It's not quite as easy to use as, say, a tablet, 
um, but it has sort of more processing power in many instances. So it, it will be, I think, uh, something that most people will adopt to pretty quickly. So is this something, um, our name, the IT guy, the county? Um, Bob Kelly, yes. Bob Kelly yeah. approached you and asked you about yes. the mm -hmm. yeah. some weeks ago or something? Uh, actually, many months ago. Um, we, I think, first heard about this in January. Um, it was one of Governor um, Moore's initiatives, and it took a while to do the announcement for some reason, um, but they got all the devices, and it is coming down from the state through the counties. Okay, thank you. Michael, I'm curious, do you know how the eligible folks are being informed of this opportunity? Well, um, there's been email blasts, there's been um, a lot of posting on social media, there has been advertisements on the radio, I understand. So they're doing their best to kind of get the word out. And we have posted information in the libraries as well. That's great. Thank you. Michael, I believe that um, County IT had also had plans to put um, door hangers um, on neighborhoods um, that, you know, where, where people might be going to need a laptop um, as well. So they're really going out there. It's a PR idea associated with this. Why don't you approach the radio station up in Mechanicsville and see if Meathead and Heather can in an on-site broadcast for one branch on one of the days? Um, I would have to talk to the county about because this is really their program. Um, <laughs> it, it's not ours. Um, we are this we are distribution nation. We're happy to work with them, but we um, are, are are not sort of the leader of it. So I, I can talk to Bob about that, though. I would want his his say so on it. Well, I was going to say, what about offering them library cards while they're here, <laughs> or access? To, this is how when you get your Chromebook, you can access the library. That might be cool. Like. Well, while you're here, let us. <laughs> um, and so we are we are trying to get our computer classes scheduled so that we can have a listing um, for customers who come in uh, for the, the summer and the fall. Um, so we're, we're pushing our program schedule a little bit to try to accommodate these events um, and, and be able to get, get folks connected to the library as well. Yeah, I, I'm sure when we have our programs that we will, we will demonstrate library resources. Um, well, Michael, I, just a note to say thank you to you and the staff for engaging in this partnership. It is so important, so crucial, and how great that the library can be this kind of resource hub for our community. So I think it's a great use of our time and energy. Thank you for doing this. Well, we'll, we'll thank you and thank you to our staff for taking on still more work, especially during summer reading program. Yeah. Um, I will not say that they were universally delighted at the idea. Um, understand Michael, that. we're really busy at that time. Um, so really thank you to all of our staff for going the extra mile for yet another community partnership. And, and we certainly try to be a great community hub and I think succeed at it. Question regarding the lunches. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, aren't they Monday through Friday? They are. At the Lexington, at the Lexington Park Club? No, it's only Friday. It's at, uh, only Friday. It's at the library. Well, actually, yeah. it, it is Monday through Friday um, for the first three weeks um, here, every Friday um, during July, and then um, Monday through Friday for the first three weeks of August also, pretty much up until school starts. Yeah, it's when school's sort of not open. Okay, so it's 12 to one. I think and that is so important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's part of the, I noticed that on the events page of the library, and I think that is so important to have that. And I, uh, I really appreciate the library taking that on. Oh, absolutely. And we, and we, we also looked to put programs before and after, like close enough that we would be able to set up, but close enough for folks to just enjoy the library a little bit and kind of, you know, ease some transportation issues for, for folks too. So we, we tried to be pretty intentional about how we programmed for this. Are we an STS stop? Yes. And, and then we also do actually send one of our staff to the Judy Center um, lunch and uh, learn site. Um, so they do programs offsite over at Carver Elementary on those weeks that um, the lunch program is at Carver Monday through Thursday. Oh, just um, we are an SDS stop here and at Charlotte Hall, but not the Leonardtown Library. Well, actually, we are at Leonardtown now, too. 
Oh, is that? Yeah, that's new? yeah. I've, okay. I've seen the SDS bus by, come by there. So it, it took us a while to get that going, but okay. yeah. And you could request the stop if you were taking that bus, but it wasn't an official stop. For yeah, I think I think it is now. We'll, okay. Either that or a lot of people are simply requesting it. But hey, yeah. Does that come in or is it at the roadside? I uh, know it, it comes into the library parking lot for the especially for the seniors. I think that that was something the county wanted. Um, um let's go ahead and move on to the current budget review and and you have that in your packet Did uh we with, skip over art grant approval um no budget was first and but i'll do art grant in a second or i can do it now i whatever yes uh the community art grant um from the state uh has been approved that's to put sculptures in the garden in front of the leonard town library and so that submission has uh uh, and it, we did not submit that grant. It, it was the Friends of St. Clement's Bay. It was decided between several of us uh, community partners who who might sort of be the best chance of getting it. But in any case, that has been granted. It's fifty thousand dollars, and that's primarily going to pay the artists for the design and the materials. And I will share that design with you. Um, Do you know when the art will be installed? uh it's going to be probably late fall anyway because she she told us she's busy throughout the summer but i'm hopeful for the fall uh, at least the start of that project i'm assuming that the artist will probably figure out a way to spend every last dime of the grant but if there's any money left over can any of it be applied to the mobile library wrap no grant is for the project only and when state grants, which is basically how you know, how our grants work, the money just doesn't sit there. It's sort of earmarked for you, and you have to submit invoice to get it, and it has to be related to that specific project. And if you don't use all the money, it does not somehow magically come to you. We try to make sure we use every penny of ours. Um, Michael, is there a the permanent invitation? Yes. And is there a theme? Is there a theme? What was what is her direction to the artist? A theme, theme, kind of art. Oh yes, thank you. A theme. I'm, I was hearing fee. Yes, there is a theme. Um, to sort of fit in with the garden, it is going to. Uh, and this artist does a lot of work with um, fired clay um, tiles. It will be. Um, themed with pollinators and native species of both birds and of plants. It's Maryland native flora and fauna. Amy D just sent that to me. Thanks. With an undertone of sex ed. Who is the artist? I'm sorry, senior woman. Um, I will get you that information. Um, she's the same woman who, and I can look up on my phone over the break if you take a break. She's the same woman who, if anybody ever seen, there's a very colorful bench in front of the Leonard Town town offices. Yeah, that's the same artist. So she's done quite a bit of work in the area. Amy D is checking for the name right now. Great, thank you. Um, so on to the budget then. Um, with many 2% of the year elapsed, obviously we're getting close. Um, and it will be necessary um, in July and even in August because we'll have expenses in coming in after the fiscal year that will build or should you know invoice this year. So we'll have to go back and factor all this in to do a budget reconciliation here because there'll be areas that have gone under and probably even more before the year's over on June 30th, and areas where there might be some money left. Um, so we are expecting to have a little bit of money left over in personnel expenses. Um, there with 91% of the, I'm sorry, 90% of the year gone by, 91% 91 of the budget has been spent. We anticipate having to move money into utilities, um, especially since we don't have most of the utility uh, fees for Lantown Library yet. We are working on getting this in a timely fashion. 
Um, so, um, but uh, you, you see the, our monthly budget amount is about 245,000 and there's about 278,000 left. We do have more pay this month. So yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. One more, one more pay this month. So we'll see what, if anything is left there and then what might have to be transferred. And to answer questions you've asked in previous month, if the money's not spent in this case, yes, we, we do get to keep it. We don't have to give up money back there. So that would be going into what we call our fund balance and we'll be visiting the fund balance later today. Um, for the health insurance, about 88% uh, spent. So um, we think that um, we may have to move some money from that that will be left in that to cover expenses that exceeded it. And just to answer questions, yes, we have a full schedule of all IT contracts and when they are going to come forward. So we're not gonna get a surprise again, like we did with the one firewall. Over on page two, um, you'll see that we've already gone substantially under in Lexi water, sewer and trash, a little bit more in electric and, and hall water, sewer and trash. Um, Smeco has sent us an email saying, you're going to be reclassified. And we are certain that that means they're going to be raising our electricity rates. So we are we classed as now, obviously not a residence. A um, there's four classifications, Belinda, you there's there's four classifications here and we're yeah. I'm not sure what we're classified right. I mean, we are a business. Um, they've sent us a letter stating they're going to reclassify and we'll learn our new reclassification on the June bill, which I should get next week. So I won't know what our new classification is until next week or how that will affect pricing. Not even sure if they'll tell us what the pricing is. So, is the classification based on like the building or the type of organization in the building? I believe it's both. Okay. But I'm not sure. And we had an increase in utility already this year. Mm -hmm. So that's why everything is over because we got an increase this year. And now they're, they did not claim it was an increase. They're just saying they're reclassifying everybody. We don't know what that means yet. But we're not hearing that about Leonardtown. No, it's no, the it's whole system. Mecco. Ah, I see. Yeah, it's, it's Mecco. Yeah. We, okay. we pay Mecco directly for Lexington Park. Mm -hmm. We pay the, the county or the city of Leonardtown, or we pay about building services for Leonardtowns because we split it between us and Garvey, mm -hmm. but it's still Smeco. And then at Hall, we pay Smyrla. Smarla gets the bill and splits it between us and Smarla. So in any case, we're, we're not anticipating a rate increase. Um, <laughs> but this says, oh, we're going to lower your bill. Um, so we, we, show you the we are trying to anticipate uh, um, what the cost next year will be, and the budget that we'll be presenting to you for next year. John? Could yeah, we I, can, I can show you the tariff yeah. document after the meeting. If, uh, well, sure. Dad, we've posted them on the website. Thanks, John. Welcome. And, and could we have a follow up next month as to what new classifications are sure. and where we fit? Sure. Thank yeah, you. We'll, we'll let you know what we've decided because that could affect the budget. Now, maybe we will, you know, um, be fortunate and it will not be an increase. It'll just be our current rate. That would be nice. Is that, um, is that why um, Lexi's electric is like twice and three times as much as the other two branches because they have shared partner? Well, they seem like the square footage is similar. So it's Lexi and Leonardtown are similar. It's just that we don't get Leonardtowns except early. So you aren't seeing that reflected in this because we already paid for 11 months of Lexington Park, but only nine months of Leonardtown. Um, and Lexi and Leonardtown are about equal in how much. So it's the size of the building and as not really in how much space we're using. Um, so I actually halls is a little less. But we still have it's still but expensive. your budget your budget for that our town is half of less the market. other variable is considered the age of the buildings. I, was, I mean I'm yeah. well so it's terribly old, but it is older than oh this a, this HVA system is 20 years old. And 
constantly, frankly, breaking down. And at Charlotte Hall, we're looking at possibly having to close the branch on some days because they're going to redo the HVA system. So those systems are substantially old, not nearly as efficient. So your town, although if you look at it, you see all that glass and windows and you think, well, gee, that must be a problem. But the system is just much more efficient in terms of how it operates. So I'd say that's the other variable there. Um, and we are hoping to have, uh, I believe, an energy audit. Um, they, they say that, well, it looks like you're using a lot at night. So we're going to try to see if there's some way we can't lower the, the usage here. Yeah, so all that is true. Like this building and Hall's H system is just terrible and needs to be replaced. So those are rising up the cost in the seat. Also, I will say that we're going to go way over on Leonard Towns because we based it on the previous year. And then the, as well as uh, SMECO going up, the county reallocated our percents between us and Garvey. And we didn't know what it was until about three months into this fiscal year. So they gave us a bigger piece of the pie. I think so. Yes. Uh, so yeah, we were, we didn't have a good idea of what Leonard Town was going to be because even even so the year before was still part COVID. We had a different percentage and we had a different SMECO rate. So they gave us some money and they take so, it away. Right. So <laughs> I I didn't have a way to estimate Leonard Towns because I, it's I, so new. Maybe remembering correctly, was there some discussion months ago, Michael, about possibly having new HVAC for this building? Um well we have for fiscal year 28, $3.5 million set aside in capital funds for the libraries. Um, but if we wait that long to replace this, I think between this, well, it looks like maybe we're going to get a new system in Charlotte Hall. And that would, of course, be wonderful um, because it's it would free up that money. I'm sorry, what? Maybe? It's just for the meeting room. Oh, it's just for the meeting room. Yeah, well, the whole thing needs to be redone. So my concern is that that $3.5 million, and we're hoping to get a million more from the state capital grant program. Um, my, my concern is that all 3.5 or call it 4.5 million will have to replace nothing but the HVAC systems, um, which it's, you know, it, it would provide comfort. It would save us substantial amounts of money over time with greater efficiency, but we really want to take a look at the buildings and do some changes to those and not just the systems. So that's kind of where that money may be. It's still five years out. And um, I, I wish that we could find some way to simply replace those core systems before that money happens. So we'll have to maybe talk with the county about that one. Is there a reason why uh, that there's one bill that there's quarterly, is that held up by the county or? Yes, so we pay, so we pay, we get Lexington Park SMECO bill directly. So I get it every month. Smarla gets their bill monthly. And so they allocate it out monthly. For whatever reason, building services holds all three and then does a calculation and sends us both the SMECO and the waste management bill quarterly. Do we see the actual uh, um, usage? Uh, do we see those numbers? She sends me a breakdown, yes, of the usage for each month. What's Lexington Park is the only branch that's open on Sundays also, right? That's that correct. is correct, Jan. So on um, operating supplies, um, you see there's very little left, and that $6,000 for staff development basically has already been spent. Um, so by the end of the year, that will be at zero. Um, for circulation and program expenses, the collections um, look like they've got a fair amount, but we've got a lot of invoices coming in before the end of the year, and we anticipate spending everything on the circulation collection and the digital collection. And that's important. We wanna make sure to give our customers as much variety and quality of materials as possible. 
Over on page three, all the mobile library money is gone and some of it was simply transferred to other purposes because of course the mobile library is not on. A reminder that I believe it's uh, September 12th will be the mobile library ribbon cutting. It should be here well before then, but we just wanted to make sure that, that it was completely ready to go and we weren't gonna have any more delays. Um, Professional services, there's relatively little money left. That's all going to be spent before the end of the year, except I hope for legal services where there's $1,700 sitting there. I hope we don't have any you have to, reason to talk to our attorney. Um, under the other, um, just about everything there will be spent and there's very little money left, little over a thousand dollars. So we're, we're looking to spend nearly all of our funding oh sorry there's another page here um uh, you, you see we've already gone over on technology so that's some of the money that we'll have to transfer it from some other places so basically um all, all the the money is mostly spent um we do have some FOL uh, donations um, that we have dipped in to spend. And um, I, I'd say we're looking fairly good. Um, over on the income side, which starts on page five, for some reason, we got $2 more than we were expecting. <laughs> we have... Why is that? They read up. Yeah, so they give us a, a solid dollar amount each month, and so they just, or if there's a split, an unequal split of a half cent, it eventually rounds up over twelve months. Yeah, it, it happened half last year months. too. Well, two extra dollars. Let's go up a coffee. Uh, so um, the kind of good news on the services is that they were more than we were expecting, but the not so good news on the fines is that they were less we were expecting. Um, or hoping for, let's say, as more and more people use digital, of course, there are no fines involved with that. Um, and circulation, although climbing very nicely, is probably still not at the pandemic level. So that's kind of the reason for that. Um, we um, spent more of the fund balance than we had intended to because of the mobile library. Um, so we have quite a bit of FOL donation sitting on hand because of the recent uh, infusion we got from them. Um, that will go towards um, uh, Hoopla, among other things, and then we just sort of hang on to it until we have substantial need. But there are restrictions on how that money can be used. It cannot be used for staff salaries, for example. Um, it can be used for staff development, for furniture, for the collections, for improvements on the buildings, and that's sort of the limit on what that can be used for. But we always find some, some good way to use it. So uh, any questions about sort of where we are? And it'll be clear for you at next month when we kind of uh, sort of initially closed out the books, although, as I say, there will still be some invoices coming in that will actually have dated for services now and we have to pay them this fiscal year and that all gets worked out between the accountants and the auditors and Belinda. All right, well, then move forward to some action items then, please. Um, the first one is a change to our weapons policy and our rules of behavior policy. We're starting to run into issues with a lot of people bringing toy guns and replica guns into the library, um, especially like Nerf guns. And they were a popular toy. And not surprisingly with the large number of un unfortunate shootings that have happened in the country, they make people nervous and they make staff nervous. And so we are asking and the changes on that sheet are in yellow to our current policy. And basically we were not allowing the um, 
possession, use, or threatening the use of any weapon previously, but we're just adding, including toy or replica weapons to that, um, with the exception of you know authorized law agents and citizens of Maryland who have concealed carry permits. And many like we won't see those weapons in any case if they're concealed. Um, and then down under rules of behavior, we've got sort of different categories. So display of a weapon, including toys and replicas, um, will be something where we just approach people and say, okay, you need to take that home, you need to take it out of the library. Um, you can't have that here. Um, down under category three, where um, we then actually have more consequences um, and typically ask people to take a vacation of, say, a month from the library or so, um, the threat or use of weapons, including toys or replicas. And that's the first um, change that I'm asking you to vote on. There's another thing down there, but I'll talk about that in a second. So if we could consider um, this policy for your uh, vote. Yeah, Just I have a question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just to make it clear. It's two different policies. It's the weapons policy, and then it's the rules of behavior policy. So they're they're just two different spots in the policy manual. Comments and questions. Yes, I have a question about the weapons policy. It's my understanding that having a Maryland permit to carry is different than having a permit to concealed carry. Am I right about that? Yes. Okay, so citizens with permits will keep all weapons properly concealed. So we're asking people who are licensed for open carry to conceal them, which I think- Actually, um, it's a little different than that, and it's more like the schools, you can't bring it in here. You can't bring it in here can't at all. Can't bring it in here, no. Including concealed? We won't know about those. And that was the exception that we're kind of allowing. I mean, if you bring it in, we don't see it. It's not like we're going to say, hey, you, do you have a gun? Um, but no, we, we do not allow weapons in the uh, firearms in the library. I think I'm stuck on a legal differentiation here. Yeah. We, so we don't you, allow any weapons. However, if it's concealed, we don't know it's there. That's the only difference. So we aren't confronting everybody who walks in the door and saying, do you have a weapon? So we don't have a weapon. If we know it's concealed, so we'll ask. So, so I think. No, I know that. So yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> saying is that you need to add Maryland concealed carry permits because you're asking them not to open carry. And I thought that word was in there, frankly. So um, we are missing it from the from the policy. It should have been there. And I believe when we approved it, it was somehow it's been left out. But so maybe we can amend this request to insert the word uh, concealed, Maryland concealed carry permits there and that might make that clear because I thought that was part of it in any case. But aren't you saying both? It's the open carry. I, and I don't know that anybody in Maryland has open carry except for law enforcement. It's so restrictive. But so you're saying you're saying no nobody can bring any weapon into the library except for law enforcement and citizens with carry permits. And that if you don't say open carry, then you're saying any of the carry permit can bring the weapon in. Yeah, and that's why I'm saying that the exception should be for Maryland concealed carry permits. But can you do that? Can you, can you do that? Yes, because we're, a, I believe the libraries are a, a protected space like a school. But what about open carry? Um, no, we, we can just do that. I mean, are you restricting concealed carry, but not open carry? We're not restricting concealed carry policy would be, we'd be allowing people with concealed okay. carry in. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Um, but we would not be allowing open display of, of weapons. And has the attorney reviewed this? Yes. Okay. And it was his suggestion that we keep the Maryland and it should have been concealed carry permits in there. Great. So to be added, so it need to be added two places. Yeah. So is it basically going to say with Maryland concealed 
and open carry permits? No, we we, we don't allow uh, people to bring weapons into the library, so we wouldn't want open carry. It's It would be only the citizens with Maryland concealed carry permits. So in both places in this weapons policy, after the word Maryland, we should have Maryland concealed carry permits for both. Yes, it should be. Yes. Yeah. Just to be clear. And I'm sorry, I, I don't know how that word concealed got left out because I specifically put it in when we okay. when we approved it before. So both the first and the second sentences need to be amended. Yes, Maryland concealed permits. Yes. I do have a question real quick. Wasn't it, weren't we saying no concealed? Carry. I thought we were going to be like more like the courthouse or school. Or even um, not at the time, the advice of our attorney was that yeah, we we had we had to leave concealed as because that was something that at the time was allowed in Maryland, and I believe it still is. But the courthouse, of course, has even more restrictive things, um, including the ability to stop people as they enter. So I, I don't think that we can can go that far in our policy. I still think there's a strange dichotomy here between we do not allow firearms in the library, except if we don't know about it. And that's just the legal legal thing we have to put up with. I mean, I don't think we can tell people who have concealed carry permits that they, and we don't know that they're bringing the weapon in, that they can't do that legally. I don't think we can we can tell them that they're not able to in the library. There's no way to enforce that. Yeah. Little, but unless no, you have but, a metal detector. But that's the security guard. you from saying that we don't want those weapons in here, period. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I mean, even though you don't have a way to enforce it, unless somebody was to, you know, take off their jacket and then they've got a side holster on and they don't realize that say, well, now you've got, that is a concealed carry. You can't just put your jacket back on. You need to take it out of the library. So I don't know. I don't, you're basically saying concealed carry can bring the weapons in the library. Um, you are saying that. You're saying that was the advice of our attorney at the time, but it's been several years since yeah. that was that policy has been reviewed. I'm not. I'm not personally opposed to that, but um, yeah, you're kind of allowing concealed carry. Yeah, if that's what um, the attorney said. I, you know. Well, I don't know if that if that opinion was a couple of years old. I think we had to look at it again. Yeah. Can I go back to the toy thing in this? Mm -hmm. Is there is there have there been specific instances in the county? or that has caused you to change this, or is this just more of a larger national trend that you're hearing Teen, about? It's teens, behavior in the library. Teens are actually pointing guns at the staff, toy guns. Toy guns. Yeah. So if you bring in an orange water pistol, plastic water pistol, that's a toy gun. We have talked to the sheriff's office about that, and they say that some of these things that we're talking about are so convincing that unless they were holding them, they cannot tell the difference. Okay. So you've had instances. Yeah, and I've given stuff. Steph an example. I, I live in a rural area. Vultures come on my roof. It's not just a problem here at Lexington Park Library. I have a starter pistol, and it's got a little orange plug, but it's in, in, inside the barrel. If I, unless I was pointing it at somebody, they couldn't see that it wasn't a real revolver. And it's very frightening for staff and for other customers in many cases. Do you think that um, you would put up signage? Because this is a new policy. You think you need to put up signage for this? I do think we will at least for some period of time. Mm -hmm. They're private. not going to know, and you want to stop them at the door, right? Yes. Yeah. A number of private businesses do, um, do have no firearm signs, mm -hmm. toy or real. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Plastic or whatever. Yeah. We don't want. This also just brings our policy to be um, consistent with the schools. The schools do not allow toy we weapons either. So I I, I feel comfortable being just like the schools. Sure. So I would suggest that we kind of continue to sort of separate these two policies, if that makes sense for folks. And perhaps we can um, finish our conversation about the weapons policy. We could entertain a motion, you know, with the amendments we've discussed. And I think we could also ask our attorney to just take another look at this paragraph and make sure that it is still appropriate and in line with the current legal landscape. And if he says we need to adjust it, we can deal with that in the short term. Does that sound reasonable for folks? I have one more suggestion though. Um, the last sentence, the one-time exceptions may be made by the library director 
I would add in writing. Mm. Otherwise, it's going to be a he said, she said. Maybe you just have a short form or I don't know. But I think if you're going to allow somebody to bring it in, we better document that. Well, I should point out the, the reason why that's there. Um, and that is that we have requests to have programs, historical programs. And so people will want to bring in like a flintlock or um, an, a, an edged weapon to display civil war or revolutionary war um, items. And we do approve those, but um, with the stipulation that when they come to the lobby, they may not be displayed and there may be no ammunition. And I think adding in writing is a good idea. I agree, I, I agree to you, um, Michael. Yeah. And that could be by email because your email exchange would, you would already have an email exchange about that. Yeah, so I, I it's do. It's not adding any burden. It, it is approved via email. So yeah. oh, that, that'd be enough to give us some legal protection. Right. So and, then and the person too. So we could amend the, the final sentence to say one time exceptions to this policy may be made by the library director, comma, in writing, comma, for objects used in conjunction. Mm -hmm. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay. All right. So at this point, um, we can entertain a motion to approve the weapons policy as amended. And the two things we've talked about in that first sentence, making the word concealed between Maryland and Kerry. In the second sentence, writing citizens with Maryland concealed carry permits. And then in the final sentence, adding that in writing clause after the words library director. Move to adopt the weapons policy as amended. Second. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Sharon. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposer of saying none, motion carries. All okay. right, and at the bottom of that page, there's another rules of behavior that we would like to see um, the changes made. Um, this isn't happening just in St. Mary's County, it's happening across the state. I talk with library directors and, and maybe it's just because of the stress of COVID. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of issues with teen behavior in libraries, things we really haven't seen a lot of before, threats, um, really unruly behavior. And so what we would like to do, um, and so basically, let's say a teen's really acting up, um, Amy's staff here can say, okay, you know, um, you're not going to threaten me. That's going to be a six month vacation for you. Um, anybody who has a suspension from the library can appeal it to Amy and or to me. Um, and what we want to do is if this is a minor, have the adult involved with the conversation. Because what we frequently find um, is that the the parent will come da, 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 and we say, well, here's what your child did. And very quickly, the parent said, did you do that? Um, so we are kind of involving the parents as more um, involved in the discussion here and trying to, um, you know, we only use suspension as a, as a last minute thing. We want kids in the library, but if really going you know, curse out our librarians or threaten people is sort of, okay, um, now you've gone too far. We just want their parents involved with this, knowing what's going on and able to talk to their parent, to their children and, and maybe help with the behavior. So when we talk about removed and restricted, or later on where we use the term suspension, is that open-ended or are there categories of length? There are, there are, yeah. And that is in the policy at large. You'll see category one and category three above. Um, that's not all the parts of those. They, they, sent, they, they do set out potential terms and they'll range from, why don't you go home today and we'll see you tomorrow to, you know, if, if somebody is going to threaten our staff with a weapon um, or, you know, I'm going to get you when you, when you leave the building this evening, they get a year. 
Um, I should point out that these are voluntary. We can, if um, the law involved law enforcement, we can get a peace order. Um, it's a much more complicated process um, to do that, but and but we have taken that step when we thought it was absolutely necessary. But in many cases, this is us telling the customer directly, and most of them follow with now that. That's a new term. Is that the same as a no trespassing order? Um, a no trespassing order can be administered by a law enforcement agent on the spot. A peace order is us going into the court and asking for that person not to be allowed in the library. However, they're, they're very they're limited. Yeah. Okay. They're very limited. Seven yeah. days, per day, they're yeah. very short. Yeah. It gives you a little breather to decide what other action you want to take. We, it's so hard to enforce. Yeah, we, we've also had occasions when we were involved with um, law enforcement and individuals, and the judge has said, how long do you want this person not to come to the library? Um, so in, in most instances, um, we don't necessarily stipulate anything. It'll depend on the action of the person. I was involved with once and I said, I think six months is appropriate. Um, so um, th there are, are other legal aspects of these. I'm just really talking about what we as a library can do because we cannot issue a, no, a legal no trespass order. I do think it's very important that we have clear grounds for suspension and clear grounds for appeal to make sure that we're not leaving gaps in the policies that can make way for you know bias or treatment that isn't fair, or consistent for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad these things are being articulated. Uh, I think, are we ready to entertain a motion to approve I these changes? I have a question. Please. Any customer age nine or older. So if you're eight and you bring a replica pistol in, Or it's just handled differently. Yeah, that's my question. So under category one rules and consequences, it says any customer aged nine or older who violates these rules will be asked to correct the problem. Children like, under nine should not be here without an adult. So it would be addressed with the adults mm -hmm. um, or it would be just them being there by themselves would be calling the sheriff. Mm -hmm. So anyone under nine needs to have an adult with them like accessible. <laughs> Um, so if they are under nine, then we're calling share control because it's a, a child. Or the case. problem of noise or whatever goes to the adult to handle. Yeah, we, 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 we tend to address it with the person who's responsible. And in some cases, that might be an older sibling, but they have somebody that we talk to rather than talk directly to someone under that age. Now, you know, Little funny in the library we might say, all right, let's let's not run or let's use our library voices. But if it comes down to a serious issue where we need to address this as discipline, we'd be talking to the older person. Yeah. And like Laura said, we do have a policy. It's posted everywhere. If there is a child in our library under the age of nine that is unaccompanied, we immediately call. They are not allowed to be left. We are you can't allow it. Right. No, the, I, the wording on this was confusing to me because it sounds like if an accompanied child who is eight who has a replica weapon or a, a toy weapon, it's not clear that that will still be addressed because it looks like the behavior is only addressed for people who are over nine. Yeah, the, the, these are these are excerpts. This is not Perfect. the entire thing, which is extremely lengthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the part we're looking at now is just the that very last paragraph. So can we entertain a motion to approve of these revisions to the rules of behavior policy? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Tressa. Second. Thank you, Dorothy. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. 
Any opposed or abstained? Okay. Um, so, Michael, I think let's take a break here. But could I ask you to please share the weapons policy with our attorney and let us know next? Mm -hmm. Any sure. updates? Okay. Yeah. So, can we entertain a motion for a five minute break? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Judith. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All in five minutes.
All right, and we're back from our break. Uh, let's turn it back over to Michael to continue with the action items. All right, well, the first is um, a couple of quick changes to the holidays policy, and then we'll have a new policy for paid time off for part-time employees. So for the holidays, um, I, I thought we had done this previously, but apparently had not added Juneteenth officially. Um, that's coming up a week from Monday. Um, so that is a federal holiday now, and we had been taking it off the last couple of years, but I would go ahead and make sure it's in the policy. Um, to Columbus Day and the day after Thanksgiving, add just a couple of other things that they are called. Um, and all employees will receive holiday pay. If the holiday falls in a day where they are regularly scheduled to work, the pay will be equivalent to their scheduled hours. So currently, um, part-time employees were not necessarily being paid on holidays. It's not really going to cost us anything to do that. Um, they, you know, previously we were allowing the ability to make up the hours or to use PTO for that, but full-time employees are getting that benefit. So we're just extending it to part-time employees. And we think that that will be a morale booster for them. Um, it will also allow them to more judiciously use their paid time off, which we'll be looking at in a couple minutes at the end of the year and holiday time. Um, so when a legal holiday falls on a Saturday or Sunday and the board does not decide to close the library another day, the library will designate the day as a floating holiday for full-time staff. And finally, um, for floating holidays, the full-time employees get seven hours leave for those. Um, so those are the changes to the holiday policy. Any questions about them? I have a question on page two. Oh, that's a different policy, please. Oh, sorry. There are no questions or comments about the holiday policy. Uh, we can enter the motion. So moved. Sharon, Second. do you have a question? Oh, thank you. Why do we have Good Friday as a floating holiday? It used to be, um, it's a day the county is closed. And it used to be a holiday for us, um, but some new director changed that, made it Columbus Day instead. Well, I was wondering why we were taking it as a holiday and not at all, and but the, now it's open, I mean, but we're still giving the day. time. Yeah. So that I think it's the the heritage of the area. Um, you're talking to the wrong person. I think we get too many holidays anyway. But my staff disagree with me totally and completely on that. <laughs> Uh, so we had John make the motion. We had Dorothy second it. Any further discussion needed before we vote? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Motion carries. Okay. Let's move over to the paid time off for part-time employees. I need to give you a bit of history because a lot of you weren't here for this. When I came here seven and a half years ago, part-time employees had no time off. Um, they could skip a session, they could make up the hours some other day, but there was no leave for them. So we drafted what you see as old policy after that. And it's been a, a morale booster, I have to say, is we're giving them a certain amount of time a year. And I should point out that um, it does not accrue from year to year. They get it a re every January. And also if they leave the library, we don't pay that out the way we do with full-time employees. And I, you know, I, I certainly wish we could, but that's the only way we can afford it with the amount of money that we have. And our attorney has reviewed that policy and it is legal according to the state of Maryland's laws and federal laws to have drafted the policy that way. So we're giving out part-time leave. Um, we want to um, amend that somewhat for um, a couple of reasons. Um, so the, the new policy is substantially more detailed as you see, um, but most of it is with, in line with the EVA policy, but there's a couple of specific things to point out to you. And the first is that um, part-time MLS, Master of Library Science, or MLIS, Master of Library Information Science, 
will receive an additional 14 hours paid time off annually. And that's to put them in line with our full-time employees who have that benefit. Well, yes. That is actually still already in the policy. It was just in the incorrect place. We oh. moved it. It's, it's been under our vacation policy, but it uh, pertains to part-time. So we moved it to the part-time section. We've always done We've that. always done that. Okay. So that's it's just a change in its place then. Thank you for that so clarification. We're, we're in the process of, we should have prefaced this. We're in the process of completely redoing the personnel manual. Um, so this is just one section we pulled out of the new manual. That's why it's more detailed than the old policy. Um, Belinda has been working on the leave policies to make sure that they are, you know, that they follow Maryland law and, and everything. But um, we wanted to change this particular policy now rather than waiting until the whole entire manual is ready because um, it, it, it's sort of a give or take. Uh, we're giving them the holidays, but now we're telling them in number six yeah. that um, or I'm sorry, number one under makeup hours that they have to use their PTO before they can um, take leave without pay or they can still yeah. make up hours as well. But we're yeah. finding that it's really hard to track um, absenteeism, you know, when it becomes an issue, if they're mm -hmm. taking paid time off. Um, so we want them to use their leave first. They can also make up their hours and then once that's exhausted, they can take uh, leave without pay. So we're also seeing a change in the workforce. Um, not picking on younger people here, but it seems to be a different expectation about work um, these days. So that in many cases, younger people will simply say, fine, I don't want to come in that day or I'm sick. and so it kind of runs into an issue of them being able to kind of constantly under our old policy, just keep taking time without being paid. And we can't run the library very effectively that way. We need people to come into the library and work. Thank you. So um, as Marianne has said in six, um, uh, we just are adding that. And it's just another one that's come, we already had in another place. On six, yeah. No, um, this was pulled from um, the kind of care recommendations for another policy within the Maryland that we've been reviewing all the as many library policies as we could. Um, I was comparing all leave, all leave policies to Maryland law, the time to care, um, and and other Maryland library policies. Um, so this is dealing with the COVID issue in the sense that we know we can't ask people to leave or just don't come to work if you're sick, but we also want to make sure that we have the ability to say, you are endangering our other staff, so we can send you home if you're doing that. We're not gonna use, we're gonna use that as little as possible, but if somebody is coming in that is visibly ill, we're going to ask them to go home. I, I'm having trouble understanding how number six relates to paid time off. It's just part of the leave. These are the leave policies. All of them. So, so to clarify, two, well, two things. What is, what is a part time employee? What's anyone under 35 hours? So, okay. um, generally, that's 28 and under for us. Then, does this entire, the top says new policy PTO for part time? Does this entire page? part-time employees only? Yes. So this rule about being asked to leave is for part-time employees. It is also in the full-time. Okay. We are adding it to the full-time and the part-time. We haven't seen the full-time yet. And a uh, heads up, you're going to see a complete draft of all of the coming up in the months ahead. Um. <laughs> the answer, Michael, your question, Michael, maybe it's that you're basically forcing them to use PTO by sending them home. Mm -hmm. so that, that is the IPTO policy is you're going to go home and if you have leave on the books you are going to be charged with your leave or they can make it up later we allow that yeah we, we will allow that option and that's below um what if, they, what if they go right to their doctor as you're fine come back an hour later then we would are you charge them an hour leave they can no. make it up if they want 
that would be an issue. If somebody is visible, yeah. they're not just saying, oh, a little bit. I think right. be, I mean, this is somebody who visibly we right. feel they are endangering other staff. This isn't something that we're going to do. Do you also see this as a um, possibly a long term disability in there? That's condition is deteriorating. The point you're saying Pretty. you're losing your balance, you're falling at work, or your your mental capacity diminished. Is that also how you see this possibly? And I don't know how you handle that if somebody just no longer has mental capacity to do their job. I have no idea. <laughs> we have had that, and so we start we start having those discussions with them early on. So it's it's not going to be out of the blue, and we're not going to send somebody home and go like, home. surprisingly one day. Usually the ones we've had, those staff have come to us and said, I'm having these issues. So we start working with them. We start seeing what we can do to adapt the position until it gets to a point where they can't. And then, then we're reaching out to our long-term disability, state right. disability, seeing how we can help them do that and where and when we have to get to the point in which they can't come. But this gives us that option and in the past we haven't had it because we haven't had a strong leave policy mm -hmm. or rules right so getting to this point has been really difficult with those positions that have even when they've come to us because we didn't have a backbone behind it that's right i mean i know the federal government's probably they they do that i have seen people told you're going to go home now and you don't come back until you have a doctor so the federal government can do it be sure we're, we're talking about it's often a moment here go ahead it just says if you're unable to perform your, your job we may we may ask you to to go it's basically saying if but, we visibly see you having issues we want you to go see a doctor safety. yeah and, let us know that you feel, and your doctor feel that you can be at work again this is just for those cases when we get to that extreme point. Okay. Isn't something I, we're doing on a daily No, I understand. I, maybe I'm being obtuse here, but I, I just find number six confusing. Like the, the top of that number list says the following policies apply to paid time off. And then we get to number six and there's nothing about paid time off. There's nothing about sending people home. It's only about you need to go get a medical statement. Yeah. Maybe okay. I cocked my head during so, the break. No, I don't know. I, I agree. That also have this it do it's duplicated uh -huh. as so in our in the new policy that we're writing we have a we have a leave topic this is actually under just general leave policies we just duplicated it under each of the specific leaves so that we made sure they read it okay um so maybe it doesn't specifically have to do with paid time off it is a general leave policy which we have documented as the general leave policy um, and we just duplicated to make sure that they're not yeah. skipping over that section and then only go to that part time or annual. Yeah, so I, think I think we can I think what's missing here is it doesn't um, the supervisor may request the staff member submit a medical statement. This is immediacy. I think I mean I'm not saying and the words is um before we leave workplace work. and not return until they have a medical statement. And there's your PTO. It's clear the person is leaving the workplace. And can't return them. Yeah. That's how I've seen it worded yeah. that way. If we added the word ability to return to work. Oh, I think I think I, the the confusion here, what I'm seeing in all these other uh, items it is overwhelming the use of PTO. So in the in number six, if in the judgment of the supervisor, a PTO staff member just insert that right there. I I think if we say it, if an if we add seven to six, you solve some of these problems um, because you're showing that. So if in the judgment of the supervisor, a staff member is unable to perform the job because of physical or mental, and I would in I would say not disability there. I think disability is is not the right word there. But you say but, we've got this policy elsewhere. Yes, strike it here, please. Just strike it. We don't need it here. If we've got it elsewhere, that's fine. Okay. And when I do the full review of these, I'd probably say, why is this duplicated anyway? Just strike six if we don't need it. Okay. But number number seven is kind of the, the business, as it were. Mm -hmm. 
that is going to prevent people from simply saying over a long period of time, still keeping their leave, um, I'm not going to come in. So we're still going to offer people the option of making up hours. We don't want to remove that. Um, yeah. It's just that we're kind of running into a, a problem with um, okay. with not being able to, as it were, call people out on this. Remember that we offer generous FMLA. We work with people. Yeah. We we are good to our employees. Michael, everything you're saying, Belinda, everything you're saying sounds completely reasonable and makes sense. I think part of this is also us seeing these excerpts without the whole picture yeah, in front of us. I, I think that's a problem, yeah. yeah. But we wanted our staff to be able to start planning better for holidays. Yeah. And we also wanted to say, okay, um, we're, we're giving you the holidays, but we're going to start getting a little bit tougher on your ability just to call off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to I want to stress that like we're giving the holidays, so we're we're giving that bonus, so they don't have to use that PTO for holidays or do makeup hours if they if they need to. Um, so, as Michael stated, what we're trying to do, and this is the main point of this change, you must use your PTO before you can take time off without leave. We still uh, we still uh, will allow that. We still will allow time off without leave at the end of the year if it fits with the library and they aren't mm -hmm. using it excessively. We're not taking that away. We're just asking them to use their PTO first because when they don't, they'll take off in January and not be paid. They'll take off in February and not be paid. They'll take off in April and not be paid. And they're banking all that PTO to then again take off in November and December excessively. Yeah. And we can't discipline that leave because our policy allowed it. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So the consensus then we dump six entirely and renumber seven, eight, nine. Yeah. So I, I think we can uh, entertain a motion to approve this policy with the amendment of deleting number six. I make a motion. Thank you, Sharon. Second. 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 Thank you, John. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. I ask a question here. I think there's a typo up at the... Uh, it's in the new policy, not the fat paragraph at the top, but the next two skinny ones and the second of the two might not be approved within the first months, plural, possessive. What are we doing there? First few months, could be first three months or just the first the month. Plural. The plural? The third paragraph. Third the, paragraph. The third paragraph from the top, use of PTO will be approved based upon the needs of the branch. And might not be approved within the first months of employment. Yeah, it's 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 the first months. It's plural. How many? That's... Okay. It also depends on time of year. Like if they start in June and it's summer reading, we might be like, we need to wait a minute. But if they started in February, which is a little bit later, we might. Actually, that more information coming soon on that. Um, we're at. We would like to add a probationary period into this mm -hmm. and it's defined and it will be in the new manual all right yeah so but we'll let's not remember that for now <laughs> all right okay um so yeah that is plural there thank you for for the question though john um our next item is the proposed fiscal year 2024 budget and we did present you with a draft version of it last month, but this is the version we'd like your approval on. Um, the biggest change um, is going to be on page one. Um, it is slightly less than the draft version we gave you by about $5,000, but that amount is going up $492,127 from this fiscal year. So with the 518 from the county and an additional about 39,000 from the state, you'll see by far the greatest amount is going as a salary adjustment and you approved the salary scale last month to give our employees as much as we possibly can of that amount um, as quickly as we can. Um, the 
health services amount so, is. I'm sorry, Michael, can I go back to that? Sure, go ahead. So what what is your full staffing complement? If everybody How many employees we have, do you mean? Yeah, if you had everybody on board, every position filled. It's about like, so, 75 or 76. I'd have to double check. My, I always keep that number, but. Yeah. Um, so if you were, so what are you estimating here? Because I know you've have a lot of, well, you used to have a lot of sh um, empty positions, correct? So I count three, every single position, even if it's empty. And this three, four, three point four four million is every job is filled all year long. Yep. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, that's not going to happen, right? That's right. So we will have vacancy credits. So you'll have what? Vacancy Vac credit. Vacancy credit, and and often what happens with that is that it um, it is used for other things at the end of the year, like we're going to have to transfer some money from there. Why? Why, why would you? Why would you fully fund something that you know is not going to happen? Because we have to have the money available for the position that we have. Right. We have but, to provide that. She means in but, case it does happen. Yes. But, but you don't have to hire. I mean, if you come, if you come in your next March and you're short funds, you don't have to fill something. But I mean, what's realistic? If you're 75 is full, what is a realistic number? Because people are always coming and going is 70, is 68. What's your realistic average number of, so, of positions? I believe, and this hasn't been calculated, so I made a, um, a rough estimate for this year, and I plan to uh, track it in this next fiscal year. I believe we run a five, probably closer to five, but a five to 10% vacancy credit. We will use that money to increase staff hours when we can. So we'll take somebody from a part-time to a full-time position if we believe we can towards the end of the fiscal year. It so allows it'll stay under it'll stay under this category mm -hmm. you're saying but yes. be perhaps used differently either between the branches could you move between branches yes we can move or just somebody gets more hours or overtime we also like this year we had some basic vacancy credit and we're putting that money towards substitutes so that mm -hmm. the staff can bring in substitutes during the month of June because they had been told sorry you're we're out of sub money so you know I see you have that in there, yes. but at your lowest point, like last year too, you were pretty low, like yeah. So that 50, was closer like to forty-five, 50. fifty employees or something really low. No, any time it's never been like that. No, we we see the turnover. It does tend to be we're looking for fifteen people. If you look at our hiring page, you see typically we'll have one or two vacancies at a time. So we had a 40% turnover throughout the year, okay. but it wasn't all at once. Right. So we okay. would maybe at one time, I think we had three or four positions, which was our most at one time, um, Phil, and but it's never. The, the, other, okay. the other thing to remember is that typically we get notice that somebody is leaving. It's usually at least two weeks and often more like a month because that's what we ask for. We must always have somebody hired into position as soon as somebody else leaves. I mean, we're not so fully staffed we can afford to have vacancies sitting around. Um, the large term And end on June 30th. Right. Yeah. But what was the original part? Oh, it's it's the same format as the 23 original budget. You can see this is what was originally budgeted for 2023. And so they're just setting up the call. Yeah. So the so the difference can be here's what we originally had. When we have adjustments, then you know that that just shows the changes that will take place. So when it says original, this means 
Uh, this starts on July 1. The original, was the original carried into the commissioner's meeting or what everything together, and this is your number. It's really the starting number, not the original number. Original just means it started. This is what you will approve will become the original budget beginning on July 1. That's the starting number. Yeah, exactly, yes. Right. Collection. If we no, 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 no. This, this, yeah. yeah. This is this is what we're starting on July one. Then any adjustment will mean okay. Um, now we're looking at the changes that we make to the budget throughout the year. Right. I am finding it helpful to refer back to Michael's monthly budget report mm -hmm. and just kind of comparing the FY twenty three original budget to the FY twenty four. Right. To see where all that information about the salary salary scale adjustment that we approved last month. How that is all feeding into the new budget that we're looking yeah. at right now. Yes. So, so this is up over the previous year of four hundred ninety-two thousand one hundred twenty-seven dollars. So that's where most of that increase from the state and from the county commissioners are going. Yes. And both those funds, unlike in some previous years, have been given to us as blocks. Yes. So we say, okay, we're going to use it as we need to. Yeah. So, so the whole personal services column has gone up from 2.9 million to 3.4 million. Yeah, and then um, I mean, you'll see that there's an increase of the total health services of about $8,000 a year, and that's to factor in increases in healthcare costs or additional people adding on. Um, and other areas, in many cases, what we've got is a best guess based on this year. Um, so, so, Michael, can I ask, about sure. utilities because we just talked about utilities going over utilities going up but your budget doesn't account for that it's actually slightly less than yes it is it's, it's it is slightly less um but we looked across different areas in some cases go ahead belinda okay so i don't it's not just a best guess i literally do a calculation of every bill that i pay each of these sections i average it out for the month if i know about an increase um i have that in for example uh what uh, trash for trash is going to go up and i just added in the new number and calculated that across 12 months so it there is a slight down but that's because some of the areas went down and you'll see we have for example leon gas we have an extra well i shouldn't say because the account there are a few that we have extra money in and some that we don't and it is a it is my everything went up this year so i'm basing that on that so smeco's letter came in after came in this week and I have no idea what that's going to be. So that is not in here because I can't calculate something I don't know. And also this was already printed. But we can make adjustments throughout the yes. year. Yes, we need to. yeah, budgets are fungible. You may make changes as needed and you've already approved some for this year. And as I say, next month we'll need to be approving quite a few transfers um, of, of funds from one, one line to another. But yes, this is, this is slightly less, um, but that again is, I'm, I'm sorry if, if you're offended by best guess, let's call it best estimate um, based on this year's expenses um, and what we are expecting for the rest of the year. Um, Can I ask another question about sure, that? Sure. So I haven't, I haven't worked work with corporate budgets before, but when I'm budgeting my, my annual budget at home, I plan for that increase. I know mostly everything's going to go up by at least 5%. Is that different? No, I have some of that factored in there. I have okay. a little bit of increase factored in there. And I know it, it doesn't, doesn't look like it, but I did look at every single bill. I looked at every mm -hmm. single estimate. I did my best. Yeah. And like Michael Dunn said, um, remember that we get a lump sum. So when we have extras in legal and extras in security, that's what we'll move in if something goes over. Um, so it's still just one lump sum of money. We're just trying to allocate where we sure. think it's going to be spent so that we can make sure we have enough money for the whole year. Um, I did do my best estimate. I can't promise it's going to be perfect, just like this year's wasn't. Um, but I do everything I can to make it as correct as possible. Mm -hmm. 
um, and I didn't, and I didn't make a lot of these until I had all 11 months. So for most of these, I had 11 months of bills and I did an estimate based on that. Okay, so not to beat up on the utilities again, but the one that jumps at me is the Leonardtown Electric for 24 is 5,400. But Leonardtown Electric in 23 is 36,000. Is that because you're- That's a typo, so I need to fix it. Okay. And so I- They should be 35. Again, so I apologize, but- Probably 35. Yeah. Does that add up for them? Right. That should probably be 35, 400, yes. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I still have to do with the quarterly billing or something, but yeah. Great. Did you have it on the sheet that I, I saw? And that would. Okay. <laughs> well, then I'll be able to do a best. <laughs> and Belinda, I think that typo might solve my question yeah. because I was like, it can't cost less next year total. And thank you for finding that one line oh, item. Thanks for that. I That's have adjusted this bill oh, yeah. so many times. I thought I catch them, but I am typing and it's flowing and across three different Excel I did budgeting for 13 years. It's and I, I apologize. And every so, time somebody finds a mistake. So I, I just added up that FY24 original budget column, replacing that 5,400 with 35,400. And the total goes from that 256 number up to 280. Um, that makes a yeah, lot at more At one sense. point, it definitely was more. So I'm like, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes it worse. So it would be 280, 286. Mm -hmm. um, rather, rather than put this off, um, I would like to. I can have it next week to send out to them. Yeah, if you'd like. well, if yeah but, but they couldn't the approve month. it before the start of the fiscal year. Yeah, if I, that's and that's an issue. I do think we need to approve the budget. Mm -hmm. We can revisit this if needed. So, but um, we we can. There there is an issue in this. Um, we can make that 286 and then increase the amount from the fund balance by that amount. Well, but for approval right now, um, yeah, I, I think that we do need to have this in place before Jan July 1. It affects, mm -hmm. the, it affects the total. Um, yes. At that no, bottom, and I, know, I don't know if we can add another 30,000 onto our total. I assume we can't. Well, it does add another 30000 onto the total. It's simply that when we ask for the additional money from the fund balance, that's where the 30000 is going to come from. So it's not going to change the final total. It's simply going to, I, I think, if I'm working it out right in my head right now, which might not be the case, <laughs> um, that if we take additional amounts from the fund balance, to that, that, that will make that adjustment. But in any case, this would be 286.11. You could give Belinda a few minutes to fix it and we can return it. Um, okay. If you wanted to talk about something else. Well, I mean, the question is are we going to just put the entire budget by 30,000 um, and take it from the fund balance? So, yeah, I, I think that's the easiest thing to do. Or keep it at 4899 and shift it from somewhere else. And, and I, I think it's going to be easier to just take it to the balance. But, and remembering that we may never end up having to do that. Well, how much is in the fund balance? Well, um, that's something we're going to get at in just a second. Okay. Um, uh, as, as our next agenda item, one of our next agenda items. But there, there would be... By the time this budget rolls around enough to handle that, I think. Remembering that that's a forecast and it's not guaranteed we'll be using the fund balance. And for this fiscal year, in fact, we think we will have a surplus and not dip into the fund balance. So I did have one more question about the 2024 budget. Uh, I'm looking in the technology section on page four as compared to last year. And I know last year we talked about how we had um, expenses of replacing equipment that wasn't planned. And I'm seeing that the numbers for 2024 
it looks like we've upped the IT contract service and then lowered the equipment maintenance. Are we, is, is some of the equipment maintenance now folded into the contract service budget? That's true. And, and so the bottom line is that on every contract comes up every year so that next year we might have to adjust this up even more if a two year contract from the year we're in two years from now would be more expensive, but that should cover we are anticipating what this year's expenses would be. Um, do we wish to go line through line through this or shall I go ahead and ask Belinda to give us what figures would be if we add 30,000 to the Leonard Town line and then add the fund balance and see what her total figure is? All right, well, we, we still have an hour, so I think that- Thank you, Belinda. Yeah, I, I think that we can move forward then if that's, if that's what you think is gonna do us best. Um, the next um, item um, is, uh, and uh, John, thank you very much for submitting uh, reports that are public now. If you submit it to the board, it has to go out to everybody. Um, so I think the point is that you wanted to formulate specific questions that you wanted to ask asset strategy. So if those are the questions that John has prepared and you simply wish to move those forward, I do have other items. Or if you wish to have a discussion of what exact questions you want to ask asset strategies, that works fine too. Uh, basically, I'm turning this to you uh, for your questions. So I told this to John earlier, how much I appreciated this. It became a fun little story. I was waiting for the next chapter on. I thought <laughs> ending on a clip. The would movie be great. in production. Right yeah, now. I'm sure. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, I, I think we can talk about different ways to go about this. I, I have half a mind to just send asset strategies this document and let see, them respond yes. and let's see what they say. I don't know if it's worth us wordsmithing things into the ground, um, but I'm very open to other ideas or thoughts. Well, uh, if we're, if we're going to do that, let's strip out some of my opinions that are in here. If, if you want to do questions, let's just do questions. I think ultimately the bigger question is, are we being well served by these people and they just hiked our rate? Well, I, I do want to point out one thing about that, and that is that we have looked at other providers for example, the one that the county has moved to, and it was twice as expensive. So I, I want you to feel comfortable that you're getting great service and that the funds are building up over time, obviously, but there becomes an issue of us, you know, paying for it now. Mm -hmm. So um, I, we, we do have built into our contract with asset strategies to build it to, to bail at one month. We just say, I'm sorry, this relationship is over one month from now. And, but we should have somebody else in place before we do that. Um, so if, you know, just, just to inform 
the, the conversation that way. I think you do need to formulate some questions. And that, those could be, John, to your point, uh, are you doing a good job for us? So, I mean, we could send them the six questions that John drafted on uh, near the end of his document. Just send them those six without the context and opinion. Does anybody have any uh, items in terms of my explanation of the data points that I picked at or how I looked at them? Did I screw any of the math up or leave any questions there? I mean, one of the big questions in using these people, are we even shooting for the right target? Hmm. Well, John, what's the document or policy document you mentioned in here? You've mentioned it before investment policy the ips mm -hmm. where is that document uh, i mean who has it all right the original one was executed and i have that in a whole different binder about uh 2012 or 2013 for the for previous. the on yes for the onset of okay. doing the opeb in the first place you could email out to us this week. and i believe the board approved now it would be before your service time um mm -hmm. i believe the board approved another one last year so um we have that uh, we can sh we can certainly share i think we should all i think we should all have that. Mm -hmm. um the big picture is i mean they've been almost 10 years that's a strategy i think it is time for a good healthy review um and I don't know why we couldn't send them these questions, but as the board decide, are we going to look at other options? I mean, um, you have to understand where we are with that asset strategy and know what else is out there. What are our options before we make a decision? Maybe something we should for like by the end of this calendar year, we're gonna have a decision on what to do. I mean, because we need to look at other investment firms and where can we go? Um, that's my feeling is we need to know what our options are. I mean, it's like, you know, you don't go out and buy the first car you see. So, or, you know, do you turn your car in? I don't know what, the, what does a new car cost, right? And even these talks about moving our funds around every time we buy and sell, they're charging us and they want to move our funds. And every single transaction, my right, John, costs us something. Well, it shouldn't in a fee-based account, but we've got two things going here. We're paying a fee to our advisors. That's asset strategies. Mm -hmm. And if you remember from last month, we also had in the EAL uh, a bill from Schwab, and they are the custodian of these things. Yeah, right. So one people's telling Not us. Linda what, here. So it's incorporated. Yeah, we're only paying. We're only okay. paying asset strategy. Okay. Yes. Yeah, they're paying. Okay. So. So we assume that yes, asset strategies is in fact the ones who. All right. I mean, questions like that is like, why? Why aren't we just going to Schwab then? I don't understand this multi-layered effect. Well, that's but that's my, what happens when you typically have an advisor, and they don't control the actual shares. Mm -hmm. Control mean hold. Yeah. So they've got to park your investment somewhere. We're parked so, at Schwab. But my other questions are: I don't know if they're for you, Michael, or for asset strategy is. How often do we get statements? Are we getting monthly statements? We get they, monthly statements. They come paper. Do we uh, like, they they come via email. Do we and have a you can also you can also log in. Access to our account. Yes. And who has the password? You. Uh, I do. Belinda does. Is that something I we can't really share a lot of passwords? But I mean, I would love to have online access to our. We can create it. But like I do think we should dashboard. be getting the monthly statements because I wanted that monthly like I get that monthly screenshot first pages. This month, last month, month ago, a year ago, five years ago, inception. Uh, okay. Right um, here on the front page. Yeah. Well, and the another thing is that I, I've sent a couple monthly statements out and said, if you want to keep getting them, let me know. Yeah. Um, so if, if I don't hear back from you, you I assume them. you're getting quite enough you're emails you're from me. I, so I feel like that's just something we should have when we come into the meet, meetings, at least until we can get a handle on this thing. It's never Let's, been part of the treasurer's report, but I can add it so that we can look at it. Thank you. If you could just send it to the group, that'd be I'd great. I'd like to start seeing what they're sending us and what it looks right, like. Sure. And then we, after you read them month after month after month, you start getting a feeling for your funds and what's happening to them. But mm -hmm. I feel like we're just in the blind here. I've just got like one screen, one point in time, March 31st, and 
every couple well, months. So that's like to get the accurate data every month on what's happening with our funds. I'll add that to the July's treasury report and, then, and I'll share it. You know, even online access, you can start digging around online and start really finding out more data on our own. We don't have to necessarily wait for them if we have online access. Yeah. We can look at everything on our account. Let me give you another chapter in the story. Um, everybody got a green folder with a proposal from Edward Jones, the firm that I used to work for, okay? Then a question arose from an attorney at Jones in dealing with a whole nother client somewhere else. I have no idea, but he saw something that made him want to talk to our attorney to see if what bothered him in that other instance was also going to bother him with us, okay? I know that sounds nebulous, but that's exactly what I knew. John, this is a little cryptic. Can you can we like get to the punchline here? The punchline is this: after much chasing of our attorney down, our attorney finally did talk to the Jones attorney, and on January nineteenth, he sent me an email referencing the um, law that was supposedly in question. The problem was it had everything to do with banking. It had nothing to do with what we're doing, which is investing, right? But having been confirmed by our attorney that, oh yeah, we do have a problem here, that whole effort. So we, there, our, our attorney says we can't invest with Edward Jones. Based, based on the feedback that our attorney gave to the Jones attorney, he decided Edward okay. Jones could not take the account. But it was all predicated on Maryland's banking law for public entities had nothing so to I, do. But we're not at the point of making a decision of no, we're pursuing not. Edward. So I think let's table that for now. I think the immediate steps that we're looking at, one, Tressa is going to share the monthly reports with us. Two, if we could recirculate the investment policy statement currently in effect so that we know what they are. Yeah. And then three, I think let's land a plane on this question of what questions we want to ask asset strategies. My suggestion would be that we send them these six questions and let's see how they respond. Are there any other steps that we want to be taking well, I, right I, now? I think we consider maybe next month setting up a subcommittee, maybe three of us that goes out and tracks down other investment firms. And then we can make a presentation there. Here's three or two or five possibilities. I mean, the whole group can't do it and one person can't do everything. So maybe that's for consideration. Do we ever do subcommittees or committees? I think we certainly could. I, then, I need to look at the county guidance about subcommittees. I think you have to meet in public as a subcommittee if you're conducting public business. Yeah, but there's an exception. I think yeah. under the closed meeting rule, we're talking investment. St. Mary's County, I don't think has that. Maryland does, but I don't think St. Mary's County allows you to have that exemption. So let me look into that. Um, I mean, I don't because know St. Mary's, it, St. Mary's uh, is even more restrictive than the state about what you can and cannot make public. So um, I'd like to, be, before you do that i, I let, let's look into it please it's just some way yeah. to move forward on options yes mm -hmm. and not expect john to do all the research and he shouldn't it shouldn't be one person it should be it yes plurality of opinions mm -hmm. and then bring it back to the group and say maybe here's some options or yes. there's no options i don't know and and it, it could be that possibly as, as long as once again, the trouble is going to have to be that you're going to have to start in an open meeting and then close it. So this is at some point going to have to be, if you're doing this, no matter at what level, you're going to have to say this is a public meeting, I'm pretty sure. But let me double check that. I don't know. What if it's a working group and there's three of us? Well, thank you, Michael, for looking into sort of how we can, yeah. a subgroup of us, so yeah. that the weight isn't all on John's shoulders. Right. We can pursue this. Okay. Michael, I think in addition to these six questions, the first paragraph that John wrote under closing thoughts, the trustees need a more user-friendly report. I think that definitely needs to be included in the feedback. It's kind of vaguely included in, in question four about the big picture data and so much data, but I think it really needs to be clearly stated. I, I agree. Um, um, I, I didn't find the uh, presentation last month to be very helpful at all. And, and, and John, it sounds like, I mean, you have a background and it sounds like the 
that you didn't find it helpful either. Is that correct? <laughs> well, I think based on our collective level of expertise and all those pages before you even get to the investments, they're blowing smoke. Baffle them with baloney. Mm -hmm. I felt that way as well, and I don't have the expertise in, in, that you do. <laughs> Okay, so back to item. <laughs> yeah, and again, I'm I'm just Bambi in the woods. I I thought their presentation was helpful. I I thought that things generally made sense. Um, so I appreciate hearing well, like other it, voices. Well, it was nice to get. have it explained, but did we need all those gazillion I, ways that, to say it? Well, we've asked for a lot of information from them, and they have obliged with the phone books that they are sending yeah, us. Right. Also, remember that under a previous administration. We clearly talked about, do we really need all this? I'm not saying none of it, but all of it. Our requests have kind of swung pendulum style. They, 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 they have, so I, I'm sure we also remember that we changed um, representatives with asset strategy from one person to another. So there, there may in the trade-off have been, yeah. you know, I, I think they came in and saying, okay, we don't know these clients. So I, I also think they looked upon that as an initial meeting to give a very full report. Yeah. If you want something, you know, more more snappy, more basic, I, I think that's a legitimate request. I don't think it's necessarily a question of how much data. When you are when you are teaching a new group, you it's how you structure it. So saying at upfront, this is where we're going, and then you have the arc that shares as much data as you need to and then you conclude with this is where we're at i missed that arc it was just a lot of different information and it doesn't have to be less it just has to be structured correctly you That's might fair. you might find that once we start looking at our monthly state session mm -hmm. have a lot of information in your monthly statement yeah so um so, okay. so i think can we Entertain a motion then to send asset strategies, the six questions here, as well as th that first sentence about the trustees need a more user-friendly report, regardless of the company we use. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But, but there, I think it's going to devolve back on us to tell them what, what that, that looks like. I mean, how many pages was that? I don't even remember. Like, 90, the first not, six or one, um, I, one, so, of, one of them was like 76 pages was one part of it. It was a lot of. A yeah, lot so of let's it. hear how they respond, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and if they are wise people, they will come back to us in a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and just to, to speak for them, they were willing to meet with you this month. And I've said, okay, we need some time. Yes. So um, yeah. I, I think. So are, are, is the upshot going to be to send the six questions? Yes. All right. And how many of you would like to be copied on that email? All of us. All of yes. you? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, um, I think we need to vote on this motion. Yeah. Any, anybody willing to make the motion? To send an email? To ask them these six, the six questions question. with okay. the language about uh, meeting. So moved. Up. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstained? Okay. All right, and so thank you, Michael, for sending that email and copying all of us. Um, and Michael, if you could please send us, do you have the IPS, the investment policy? Yeah, um, the, the, the one that the board approved. Um, yes. I think it was December of 2022. If not, it was December 2021. Um, it will be in the... Um, the board packets that were received that day, and we keep all that information. So yes, could I you can, please recirculate? Yeah, that? yeah, absolutely. Um, and then thank you as well for looking into this subcommittee question. And then Tressa will start sharing the monthly reports with us. Yeah. And yes. three things. Great. That's great. a, a that's quick great. enough check. I just want to. I just want to make sure we're we're good with with the county's more restrictive. Yes. I appreciate policies. your care with that. Um, it's quite complicated. Yeah. Um. Well, we do have another um, thing to do, unless Belinda says she's ready. Um, and that is, we've been kicking around quite some time. What from fiscal year 22, which ended last June, <laughs> to do with the um, any overage that we had? And, and again, the best policy on this, although occasionally we've just we've got this money we're putting in, we're not opposed at all to putting money into, into the OPEB account. Let's make that clear up front. It's just how much 
based on our fund balance. And this is a year we took a lot out of that fund balance. Now, let's give you two things up front. The first is that we don't have this account sitting there that is the fund balance. That's what we've got. What we have is constant up and down in two accounts, basically. There's the MGLIP account, which is what the state puts money into and the county puts money into. And then there's our checking account. And basically what we look upon as the fund balance, but I should tell you that Belinda's working with her accountants to try to give you the most accurate idea but it's gonna change month to month and even week to week about what the money that's sort of earmarked would be. And we think it might be higher than the estimate we gave you last time, but we're working, trying to get you the best number we possibly can. So that's the first thing. The second thing is some good news. And I've told you before that the state looked at what we were paying out for the mobile library and and I, I need to thank uh, Marianne for this, for talking with the state at, a, at a, I think probably complaining or at least crying at a meeting um, saying, you know, we're, we're out a lot more money because of this delay. And they said, well, St. Mary's County Library does a lot for us. You know, you, you passed through that book grant, Michael, you've been, you know, a leader in this, that, and the other thing. We're going to give you some money. That didn't total a lot, but we have an additional money uh, refunds of um, $8,590.58 that came in above that grant. So that money is going to go into our fund balance. Is that reflected on any of these documents? Very sad. Not, not yet, no. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to... Yeah, so it's, all right. So the, the reason why I bring that up is if you look at one sheet that I have given you, um, it talks a little a bit about what last year's overage was and then how we think this year we are sort of using that. So the overage last year and we've given you these documents for months now, but it was $18,082.12. That was our net income. You're talking about 22. Yes. 2021, That was 22. We haven't, we're not talking about 23 at all now. So, ah, thank you. Um, so the expenses on that, and again, this is another sheet that I gave. Um, It says mobile library funding and expenses update at the top, and we haven't had a chance to update this with that additional amount in. But um, then it says fund balance amount, and our our best guess from that it actually includes some money that came in this year was forty five thousand one hundred and seventeen dollars was our as it were our health share refund. We paid out more for that than we had to. So we got that back. It was $533,000. So minus your FOL and your donations, which may not be used to go into the OPEP, those have to stay out. Those are earmarked for something, not for benefiting our retired staff's pay. The current balance on that is $32,571. So that's money that you cannot earmark for the OPEP. Our fund balance use for fiscal year 23, money that we've said we're going to take out of the fund balance. Now, we may not, but that's in our budget for this year. Take that away. The fund balance available amount goes down to $438,661 minus the mobile library. And again, there's about an $8,000 adjustment there. 
We've already spent that money. It goes under $342,863. Your library expenses per month for fiscal year 23, this year, $345,719. So that leaves you, if you don't want to dip further into the fund balance, more than one month's worth of expenses for the library, less than 2000 basically you'd be $2,000 in the hole already. Mm -hmm. So my proposal to you is since we got 8,000 some dollars back is that for this year, we move that into the OPEB fund balance or the OPEB balance that $8,590 basically. And then come no November, when you're going to have the audit approved, we look at this again and at that time say, what is our fund balance? What did we gain in 2023, which we won't know until after the accountants and the auditors are done, and then look again at putting more into the OPEP account. And what again was the, um, the health account? What again was the health care refund? That was 45,000. 107. 100 and yeah. It's here on this paper. Is that under on your budget? Well, 23 and 24 health insurance. The first line item is OPEB and this, and for 24, we have $97,000. Um, OPEM, what we do with that amount is that that is the pay-go amount. So currently, our retired employees are having their health insurance paid for, in part, most of them at 85%. So what happens is you retire from the library, and you are eligible through the state of getting these retirement health care. And for most of our employees, they retire at quite a, you know, after some of them, we had one who retired with 50 years, one who retired with 49 years, they get 85% of that healthcare benefit paid for. And that amount that we have set aside there, $97,000 is what we're using to do that while the OPEB grows. That's retire. So it's basically our share of retirees. Yes. And then the idea of the OPEB is that if it can get to 75% of the amount we want to fund it at, which is like $3.4 million, um, that then we'll start taking dividends from that and paying that amount and freeing up that amount of $97,000 for the library. I see, that's year. why we're not seeing any withdrawals out of our investment with asset strategies. Exactly. We're not taking because any money be, out of that. Be at zero. Yeah, everything... <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay, yeah so everything. Great. We're paying for OPEB every year. Yes, we're, we're paying. Yeah. We're paying for operating. the healthcare benefits every year. We're not. We don't have that sufficient. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that that's the idea of the OPEB, okay. and I should point out that I, I I think the OPEB account is a good idea, but there are many Maryland libraries who do nothing with that. Okay. Second question: When you mention the fund balance. Mm -hmm. Um, the one to two months, where does that number come from? Is it a recommended? Is it a rule? Is it just what you think is good? It's, it's a general rule for an organization for accounting that you should have two months on hand. But it's not an absolute rule that you have to have that. But we'd like at least one month for expenses because there are times when we do not get our infusion from the state and the county exactly on schedule. It's and so what we've sometimes had to do is say, we're not going to pay any bills now um, just to make sure that we're going to cover all our expenses. Sometimes the amount goes down that low. So this is kind of like an average amount we keep. You can't make payroll because you haven't got your allotment? To avoid. Same, same month?
the kind of emergency savings. And then when the money comes in, you put it right back in. So you yes. can see you can see you took out eighty nine thousand. Then the next week you put in eighty nine thousand. So we can see this, this in and out. Yes. And does it match pretty much dollar for dollar? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. I understand. So so the real question then is on the year did we make and this has been the board's previous direction did we make more did we bring in more than we spent. And that amount would do two things um, in past decisions. And th that's the way I think it's best done and the way I'd like us to go back to is, okay, um, you can move that into the OPEB account to try to build it up. And we gave you the last couple of months sheets where we talked about the exact amounts that had been put into the OPEB in the past. And the other thing you can do is I think we need to save, hang on to that money for some other purpose. And it's a case by case basis. So what I'm saying is that if we're going to keep one month of expenses in the so-called fund balance, that this, the end of sort of right now, what's in the fund balance with expenses this year that take away from that fund balance, you don't have any play there at this point. But we just got $8,590 that are going back into the fund balance. So if you want to invest something into OPEB, that's roughly what we're talking and still have a month where, a month of play in the um, fund balance. And then next November, let's do this early. You'll have the accounting statement, you'll have the um, audit. And in many cases, I rely specifically on the accounting statement because it's an exact this year or the, you know, for that year, what went in, what came out. Whereas the audit often factors in depreciation and things like that. Um, so that you'll be able to say then, all right, here's where the fund balance is. Here's what we made last year. Let's say at the end of this year, July, you know, June 30th, we clear $80,000. We're probably not going to have that kind of mobile library expense. You could say, I want $80,000 to go into the fund, into the OPEB. That will be your decision then. Right now, it just doesn't look like if we're going to keep one month's expense on hand, especially since now I'm really feeling confident about that $50,000 from the state at this point, but we haven't seen it yet. Belinda, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I think you called it the MLGIP account where the fund balance is. Is it an interest earning account? Yes. And do you know the rate? Or approximately, I know it changes all the time. I don't know it off the top of my head. I will say that last year, before they were increasing the interest rates, we were making about $2 a month. It's a, <laughs> and we are making $1,000 a month now. Okay. And that is reflected in your FY23 budget under investments. I wondered. Account. Yes. I you thought that thousand dollars a month now on interest. Approximately. I mean, it varies, of course. Well, what, what bank is this? Uh, it is with a PNC bank. That's what I thought. So on page five of your, well, let me look at, I'm looking at the FY23. On page, yes, five of your FY23 budget, uh, other income. Mm -hmm. fund balance and investments. So investments, the amount taken in is what we've gotten in interest in that MLGIP account this year. Is there a minimum balance to earn that level of interest? Is it a tiered structure? I don't know. Okay. Because what I'm, what the, the reasons that I'm asking these questions is if you're going to transfer that money into OPEB, you're assuming it's going to earn comparable rates you know, or, or better, we would hope better. Well, you're going to hope the stock market will do better than the interest rate. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But if the, the risk to not having the money in payroll is like, if you're wanting to consider that versus a very marginal increase in the stock market versus what, versus what that is, it's kind of a different question to me. Mm. Right. What interest I, are we getting at our checking account? Well, that's that's the yeah the MLGIP. Oh, separate oh checking sure. Account. Yep, that one too. Uh, well, we don't keep that much money in it, so it's I'm not sure what interest we've gotten in there. I'd have to look. 
the checking account. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. Well, they charge us so many fees. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty negative. Pretty negative. Pretty negative. Pretty negative. Yeah. 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 We're not earning any dollars. major. Well, I, That's another issue. Like yeah. TNC so the question before us is if we want to move this eight thousand and change right now into the OPEB account. Well, let me let me muddy the waters a little bit here. So we got forty five thousand and change. I wrote it down somewhere. That is included in the fund balance already, though. Pardon? That is already included in what the fund balance amount is of five hundred thirty three thousand. That's correct. Yes. But what the point I want to make is that in talking with Jeanette Cudmore about uh, refunds on the health thing, um, she says, "Well, that's got to go straight back into OPEP." Now that's no, it does not. The county doesn't do that. No, I know exactly what the county does with that, sir. They keep it till next year to offset future expenses. Please ask Jeanette Cudmore. I guarantee that's what they do. Um, also, John, uh, by putting it into the fund balance, we're then pulling it back in FY24 in that use of fund balance, which will be used to offset the OPEB health insurance payment of $97,000. So it's still going back into OPEB. So we've got operating money on that line, right? Yes, yes we have both. It's yeah, it's kind of muddied there. I mean, it is. I I at the moment. So let me I, also I, tell I, you I, that to answer your question about eight thousand, I think putting eight thousand into OPEB is a low priority to me. Mm -hmm. I think we need to figure out our our investment strategy first and get that account straightened and 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 that account making money for us. 10% would be $100,000 a year. In 10 years, you'd have, you'd have $2 million. We need, to, we need to start making money on our money. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not really, and we have 1.2 right now. So if something happened, we do have some money we could draw on something. I don't know what would happen that we needed it. Just a little priority for me. I'd rather, I'd rather see it in the fund balance just because mm -hmm. I hate to see us. That's kind of ridiculous that we have to run into a savings account to pay make payroll but that's the way it is i know that's the way it is so yeah. that's just my, my also just so you know the accountant and i are working on um on that on the health insurance how the money comes how that refund comes in and how we're uh, applying it directly to opeb in the future we're working through that process right now because it's been a little bit muddied um so that's on our list we're working with the auditor to try to figure out where they were putting that in the audit and we were finding that they aren't really doing anything. They're lumping it into something else. So we are working on that. That's our priority. And the, and the other priority is making sure that I know what the actual fund balance is in the future. Again, it's not something that was fully tracked. We, I mean, all the money's there, but there wasn't a, a number pulled out that said, this is our fund balance. So because it was in, we have three accounts, it's in all three of those accounts. So we're both, we're working I'm working with the accountant in the next few months. Um, we've been, this has been on our topic for several months to get this straight so that I will have a purer number for you sometime in this next fiscal year. Judith, let me help you a little bit on this. Uh, you're talking about priority. I'm looking at the um, schedule of contributions to net OPEB for the year ended June 30, 2022. Okay. So going back all the way to 2015, every single year, compared to what the actuarially determined contribution should be, we are underfunded by $136,627, an average of $17,078 a month, I'm sorry, a year across that time frame. So my point is, that regardless of what we are or aren't doing with what our money is supposedly working at asset strategies, we have a compounded problem of we are grossly underfunding what our actuarially determined obligations are. Okay. We've gotten close in one year, we did 115 and change on 119. Here's a 103 on a 105. Where, I'm sorry, where are these numbers coming from? Because we haven't put that money into the OPEB account. Michael, those were the original numbers that the county gave us at the at the start. 
Okay. That's it. That was yeah. county money, not ours. Yeah. It's a line into our budget. We go to the county for money. But where's the money going to come from? We have. Oh, yes, we have, additional. and they've denied it. We yeah, have, we, we've asked time and time again. Yeah. So yeah. You're saying it doesn't to me is not. So I, I think in the interest of time and the need for us to revisit the budget, um, maybe let's try to get an answer on this question, whether it's going to be a yes or a no. Um, can we, does anybody want to make a motion to move this $8,000 and change into the OPEB balance now? I have to say, I'm not quite sure what is going on. So I'm just going to throw that <laughs> out there. That's okay. That. All right. Nobody's willing to make the motion. So this comes down to $8,000 or nothing. Yes, at this time. But then after the audit and the accountants come back in November, we can revisit this well, question. Let me ask you another question. The question is, well, we have 8000 now that's on the table. Do we want to move it into OPEB, OPEB now or not? Or it stays in the fund balance if we do nothing. Is that right? Yes. So we still have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you still have the money. It's still going to be okay. there. It's not going to be spent. So I think, it, so do we want to make a motion to move it now or do we not? All right. Nobody wants to make the motion. Let's move on with the meeting. I, I will say that the OPEB funding has been a headache ever since they started it because they're not giving us the money to adequately fund it. And we have no other source. The only source we have for it is our books. That's the only fungible thing we've got. So you want to take money out of the book account? I don't think so. So that's the only thing that's not utilities. That's not computer expenses. That's not salaries. That's the only thing we've got that we could say, yep, take money out of this. Just don't think it's right. Well, where are we getting the PAYGO money? That came back from, oh, no, that's, that's budgeted every year. And it was part of the county budget for us. So that's kind of built in each year. Here's the money the county gives us. We take some of that out. But if we're going to take more, we're going to have to take it from somewhere else. And there's no place else to take it from other than the, than the materials. But, it, but if, that's, if that's a line item in our operating... It is, it and is. we use it for PAYGO. All right. And we, we are not using all of it every year. Well, we, we pretty much do use it all every year. I looked at last year's numbers, and we theoretically had a nine thousand dollars before any adjustments that wasn't but, used. You know, that's that's a, not much of our overall budget. Well, then why we're, aren't we're we... just saying you know you could put eight thousand in now, but Michael, I, I think this conversation's done. Can I can I just say one thing? Um, as a staff member, if I see the board putting money into an investment account and not into the current staff salaries. I mean, right now we're we're not fully funded to be what we need to be. And that's why we had this big ask this year. And for you all to be talking about putting money into investments from, and you're taking it from our operating bu budget, essentially. I mean, it's in the fund balance, but we need that money for, for things. We have furniture that is falling apart. We have so many needs. And to hear you all discussing about putting money into investments, to me, um, you know, I'm not speaking as deputy director right now. I'm speaking as a staff member. It, it upsets me because I probably will retire from this library system. I've worked here almost 25 years. And I recognize that the OPEB is there for me in the future. But we're paying for it right now. We're, we figured it out. So just wanted to give you my perspective. Well, Thanks, I man. appreciate your concern and your input. But I got to tell you, we are also trustees on that account. And that brings our level of responsibility and legal liability to a whole different level. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line there. I, we need to move forward to address the FY24 budget. So we have a new version of that for you. Thank you, Belinda. Um, yes. It has fixed the amount at Leon Electric mm -hmm. to uh, what we hope 
um, <laughs> what we hope it will be as opposed to more. Um, it has kept the first two lines we reviewed, the first two grids we reviewed. It has upped the amount of utilities moving into, um, let me find my other sheet. Um, the Many of the other items are either the same or slightly less because most of that, but the IT budget will increase a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at office supplies being more or less stable at the circulation and program expenses being fairly stable. Note that there is a decrease in the print collection of $325,000, down about $25,000, but an increase in digital collection. And so we are slightly funding that slightly less. Um, my directive to, um, we're, we're going to be, begin an F-18 flyover. Um, um, we are going to begin looking at how we do the materials in quite a bit more detail this fall, and we want to make sure that we're spending as much as the other counties and not and keeping as much in that line as possible. Because frankly, for most people, we're still books, and I don't want to see any more decreases in that that budget line. Mobile library expenses are up, of course, because we're going to have a mobile library. The um, insurance amount uh, down at the bottom of page three is also up because we anticipate the mobile library insurance, and this is based on other counties' amounts. We won't know exactly until we can get them the VIN number, um, but being up about probably $7,000 a year. Um, so... Those are the primary lines where you see change. Other than under technology, that budget is increasing because we have a better idea of making sure what all the accounts are going to cost. So um, estimating FOL donations at 20,000 and not putting anything for donations, we just don't know what those amounts will be. Um, Frankly, if I had my way, the FOL would spend money directly and not give it to us. They made that change themselves some years back because they'd rather just have, have the money and not have to write checks. But um, that's how they do it. Um, we are getting $5,000 more from Smurla for their grant to us um, for staff development. And that's sort of your total picture there um, with the final budget number being on the bottom of page five, 492,200, uh, $4,929,945 that we're expecting in and that we expect to spend. Um, we don't yet know about any grant funding we'll have for next year other than the Smurla grant, but I have applied for uh, four grants. So I will add grants as they come in and also on the screen, if you would like me to talk you through anything, this is my utilities estimate. Um, so if you would like me to do that, I can. If not, that's fine too. No, thank you. Changing the one line item fixed the estimate that I was looking at. Sharp eyes, thank you. Judith. So we can entertain a motion to approve this FY 2024 proposed budget. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Motion carries. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, that is pretty much it. Um, we had set aside. <laughs> Um, Michael, uh, actually, new trustee business for you. I'd like to raise before we wrap things up. Um, the, the board effectiveness report, I think it's been on the agenda for a while. We've all been carrying it around. I know. Are we going to do something with this? Um, and it's a whole issue in itself. It's one of those times I feel like we need a separate meeting. And they, my question to you is they recommend training. Where is this training? Who gives it and how do we get, how do we get it? 
And well, have you, have there, you done any of this training? There's various so. places that can yeah. come from, including from Smyrla. Smyrla gives training to the libraries and board members are eligible. It would be a depend on what you wanted training in. And you, you do have a fund of your own um, that will be paying in part for one of our interns. It's getting close to the corpus amount, but you, you could uh, arrange for training of your own. Um, but we'll happily work with you if there's particular training you'd like. And in fact, it has come before Smurla that, um, and, and John, please second me on this, that they give their board training and they would possibly be willing to include you in that. Is there a, a type of training you'd like? Smurla? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smurla's board has training. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if this is something for the Institute of Muse Museum and Library Sciences or Maris State Libraries, if they recommend we have this training, I don't know if they have it or they offer it, or if you go in and we travel up to Annapolis, maybe they, I'm just not sure. I just thought maybe somebody Judith, has a specific last, last year, John and Michael and I were in on it. The county attorney's office had, it was practically mandatory, board participation across all of the county boards. And they had an attorney lecture us on things we're supposed to be and not supposed to be doing. And then some of that's in here, like how to run a meeting, yeah, facilitate that, a meeting, that was helpful. the duties, but some of it is 21st century trends in libraries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or or the fiduciary piece. I think, fiduciary, I think yes. that would be really beneficial yeah. for us. United for Libraries offers board training and at state was paying for that for um, they've downgraded the amount they're paying, but I think we're still eligible to get you training through that. Webinars and yeah. such, I can. I it, it is can webinars. Their yeah. Newsletter, I'll send it. Thank you. And and are those generally trainings that we do individually on our own, like through the computer, or because if we all get together, then it becomes an open meeting? These are, are I know, more they're complicated. webinars. Okay. Well, even okay. if you go to a class and somebody's leading the class, is that a meeting? It no, I guess can't not. Can't be. I mean, so page. But I, I think if but if we brought somebody in to talk to us as a group, okay. we may be getting closer to an open meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So that yeah, they recommend right sharing meetings, facilitation, fundraising, fundraising, and donor. It's kind of different. Networking. I don't know what that means. Parliamentary procedure. That's all running meetings. But they've got twenty first century library trends, change management, succession planning. Are they talking about the board? When we talked about recruiting. There's something here about also like how to recruit members, which is interesting because I don't think we have any methodology for recruiting members <laughs> except for asking our neighbors. So, okay. So, I, I mean, maybe I'll look into this and see if they, I mean, I'd be happy to get online if they have any specific classes. Thank I you. just wasn't sure since this keep, keeps appearing on our agenda. Well, yeah, I think we can scratch it now. Okay. Um, I also think that if, if we are able to all take a common webinar on one of these topics, it would be great if we could then come back and talk mm -hmm. about it at a meeting and that could be our homework for the month okay. to have a good conversation when we return. Well, I'd be happy to look into this and see what I can find available for us. Thank you. Just so the, it, sorry, uh, has United for Libraries virtual trustees, friends, and foundation. First through third. That'd be great. Yeah, thank you. I think in particular, as we're looking at the, there was the strategy, the long-term strategy question, yeah. being able to have some knowledge going into that of whether that strategy makes sense or not, some kind of training on the trends of libraries would be particularly helpful. Yeah. Do we have a strategic plan? I think we're about to embark on one, correct? The library has one. If you're asking if the board has one, not to my knowledge. No. The library has one. The library has one. And, and yes, we are. I've asked for a grant to uh, begin that um, process. It's usually best if you can have an outside consultant come in and guide the process and organize it for you. Although the first year I was here, I, I did one for the library myself. So we're hoping to begin that process this fall, and you will be involved with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other new business before I can take care of your state of the libraries report very quickly? You see, it's almost all about the challenges that are going on to materials across the country, which now include states passing laws that will involve jail time and fines for libraries who promote so-called obscene material without defining what obscenity is. 
So this is a very problematic time. I will say that two lawsuits have been launched in Texas and in Florida against school boards or a library board in one case that put these policies forward to try to push back against this kind of censorship. Um, expect to see this sort of controversy continue until the general election um, in 2024, um, because it is a way to generate outrage um, and try to win votes. So um, that's, I, I think that State of Libraries is almost all about this unprecedented number of challenges. We have not seen much in county here, fortunately. Calvert, not the public library, but the schools are seeing quite a bit of controversy over it, as you may have noticed in the media. So uh, Southern Maryland is not immune to it. So far, knock on wood, we are um, basically not seeing a lot of it. I would like to let you know that the artist's name for the front front garden is Perrin Collery. Yes, Perrin, thank you, P-E-R-R-A-N. Thank you. Uh, so our next meeting is on July 14th. I will be out of town that day, but I'll be with you in spirit. So, and, and note the location of that, Charlotte Hall Library. Yes. Um, we are going north, assuming that the air conditioner is working. Okay. You said you will share the meeting or not? Uh, no, I will not be there. Okay. So we'll we'll talk through that and figure things out. All right. All right. Any other business before we wrap things up? Can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everybody.